antimicrobial drugs, and antibiotics. All right, so this all kind of begins with a guy named by the name of Paul Elrich. This is the first person to ever come up with the idea of chemotherapy, uh, which is the use of using a chemical compound, what else would they use, for therapeutic purposes. And he had coined the term actually selective toxicity, which is basically saying uh, how much can something be toxic to a microbe, toxic to a microbe that is causing a disease, and then how well something can be non-toxic to the humans or to the hosts or whatever you're dealing with. Sometimes this can be very toxic, um, but have enough, just long enough to kill whatever's inside of you and then your body will recuperate and sometimes this can be completely harmless to you when taken and he was actually he used a large number of trials trying to treat syphilis and he used a compound called arsphenamine uh, or salverson uh, to treat syphilis he tested 606 compounds before he finally got something successful if he was a scientist in today's world he'd never get a phd but hey he got one then all right so up in the 1930s, they come out with a compound uh, called safanamide. Uh, and this is based off of a uh, molecule called PAB, which is a paraminobenzoic acid. And it is a substrate for a particular enzyme that it aids in the folic acid synthesis for bacterium uh, or for bacteria. So bacteria are producing their own uh, folic acid through a biosynthetic pathway that only that is unique to them. And so this is one of those sites that if it's unique just to them, well, we can use that for selective toxicity. And so what this does is sulfanavide acts as an inhibitor of the enzyme that plays a role in the formation of folic acid. Now this isn't going to be uh, caustic to humans because we don't really make folic acid by the same biosynthetic pathway. We don't really make it, to, to be honest. We eat it, uh, and then once we've ingested some form of folic acid, we can then, you know, modify it and, you know, use it for whatever purposes we need, but we don't just produce it um, by means of our own uh, synthetic pathways. Bacteria do that. And so the discovery of sulfanamides gave rise to any of the sulfa-based antibiotics. The problem with this was that it did have some pretty unpleasant side effects. Um, this was still a long way to go, but these are still used even today. Uh, prior to, this is a pre, I guess we're talking about pre-penicillin uh, era antibiotics. So cool. Another form of uh, synthetic drugs that we can use is a lot of synthetic drugs that are being used at the time. An example of this would be isoniazid, which is a competitive inhibitor. So if you know you have your enzyme here, it is something that is going to, and say that this right here is the active site, it's going to, to bind and inhibit that enzyme's activity. It's a competitor of enzymes that use a vitamin called pyridoxine, or as we, for those of us that speak English, vitamin B6. Uh, and this was really helpful in treating tuberculosis. And even now today, with as much difficulty as we've had, especially if you live in North Korea, we're dealing with TB, uh, we use this as part of a cocktail, even today, and this was created a long time ago. So I just wanted to briefly talk about drugs versus antibiotics. Some people use them as synonymous terms, and then some people use them um, distinctively. So if an antibiotic is something that is derived from nature, derived from nature, um, you all know the story of uh, Linus, pa uh, Linus Pauling, <laughs> wow, Alexander Fleming and uh, his story about penicillin. You know, he had his lab, he left his you know, went home, he was working on bacteria, went off from vacation and came back and found that there's this uh, bacterial growth that had been inhibited around this fungal mold, fungal mold. And then a drug is something that is generally used by a synthetic reaction. So we're in a lab uh, and we can, you know, through some whatever chemical reaction that we're working with, we can create this drug artificially and then produce it in mass. Penicillin, though, for the longest time was derived uh, specifically from fungal compounds. So cool. All right, so what are some sources of uh, medically important antibiotics that we can get? Well, we have gram-positive bacteria. This is one of those. So, so streptomyces and the related genera. This is where we get tetracyclines, chloramphenicol, rifamycins, aminoglycosides, macrolids, and polyenes. Um, and then also the bacillus has a lot of peptide-based antibiotics. Um, for actions. We'll go into a lot more detail on those later. Another source of it would be include the fungi, which we have already talked about previously. Uh, penicillium comes is where we get the penicillin from, and then from acromium is where we get the cephalosporins. Also, 
Fungi are really good at cleaning up anything that has carbon. They can really play a role in a lot of the oil spills. So they're good at uh, statin drugs. This includes, you know, like uh, nystatin, which is good for, I guess, treating any type of a fungal infection, and then also at uh, lowering cholesterol. Lowering cholesterol because they're, you know, what are fungi good at? Well, they're good at decomposing carbon compounds. All right, so there's just two terms that I really wanted to highlight here, and I think that they should be, I guess, brought up in different pathways. I thought that would look different on the slide. So, but anyways, narrow spectrum versus a broad spectrum. So if something is a narrow spectrum, it is a very, very specific, specific antibiotic as opposed to a broad spectrum. Well, it's, 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 it's general or a general base. It's a broad, it's casting a very wide net. So I guess example of this that we have is something that would only inhibit the use of gram-positive bacteria would be penicillin. As we talked about it later, uh, it inhibits that transpeptidase action of forming that NAGNAM crosslink on the cell wall. So it's only going to be really effective against gram-positive bacteria. And then there's gram-negative bacteria, such as polymyxins, uh, B and E. And then for fungi only is nystatin, just because of the, I guess, mechanism that it has on this membrane. That's why it's really specific for nystatin. And then also there's the general uh, or broad spectrum antibiotics. And these are things that they just, they kill every, <laughs> every type of microbe that they can, uh, you know, get and come into contact with. And they'll usually, uh, inhibit protein synthesis by binding to the ribosomes or inhibit DNA replication, uh, with gyrase, as we've already talked about. So what are some common, I guess, uh, mechanisms of action amongst antibiotics? Well, there's the inhibition of protein synth uh, synthesis, and this is usually to, uh, binding to both the, uh, uh, both the large and the small ribosomal subunits. Ribosomal subunits. But it's mostly just the small subunits because um, their structure really doesn't change too much when you vary from one type of bacterium to the next. So um, there are those that, I guess this is where we would process this, and there are those who inhibit translation. There are the uh, rifamycins, which do uh, mess with bacterial transcription. But chloramphenicol, macrolids, uh, aminoglycosides, tetracyclines, all these are binding to ribosomes and inhibiting that process from going. And if you can't make proteins, you die almost instantly. And then there's also those that cause certain damage to the cell membrane. These include the uh, uh, gramicidin and polymyxin. And then if you want to talk about uh, antifungal, the nystatin comes up again, and then uh, uh, amphotectrin, amphotericin B. Cool. All right, so um, there's also various bacteria, and these are generally uh, both classified as broad spectrum because of this ability, is they inhibit a DNA replication. This include the quinolones, uh, actinomycin, uh, mitomycin, anything <laughs> among that sort. And really what they want to do is they inhibit, inhibit gyrase, which we've talked about earlier, but whenever you're having that replosome is replicating DNA, it causes that coil and gyrase or topoisomerase, depending on what species you're talking about here, makes you know intentional cuts to prevent that from happening. But if you inhibit gyrase, they can't reproduce. So there are some problems, however, with the use of antibiotics. For example, there's a lot of toxic side effects. Um, when we're using something, um, and this is for any any metabolic pathway, you, you, not necessarily just uh, streptomycin or uh, tetracycline, your skin <laughs> isn't repairing itself when you're taking that, so that's why they say stay out of the sunlight. Um, they can also cause pretty permanent uh, damage to your teeth and uh, staining which is not really pleasant to look at, but also because it causes damage to the enamel. Allergic reactions, penicillin and morphine. Those are the two most commonly, uh, I guess, allergic reaction-based drugs where you get a lot of anaphylaxis from taking them. Overuse of them can suppress the immune system and may actually do more harm than good. If you're taking an antibiotic um, over and over again, one, you, be, you will become less, uh, it will become less effective. Uh, you will have more sarcoplasmic reticulum built up in your liver, and that's not really the best things that you could do. It also causes destruction of normal microbial flora. If you ever see somebody who's been on a lot of antibiotics and their tongue looks kind of black or they have a thrush, those are um, the normal flora being killed and opportunistic infections are starting to take place there. 
So that's really not the best thing for someone either, because this that can actually kill you in certain cases. And then obviously the most exponential problem with using antibiotics is that this puts a selective pressure on them uh, for resistance. So we need to minimize the amount of antibiotics we prescribed, and we shouldn't be using them to give for viral infections. And I can't tell you how many times I could walk into a general practitioner's office and say, I have a sore throat, here's an antibiotic, now get the hell out of my office.